so today is kind of the, the title implies, we're gonna be talking about maximizing uh, facility performance with particular interest with the HVAC and irrigation systems. We'll be hearing from uh, three experts and then following that, we'll go ahead and open it up to questions from the audience. Um, we will kind of hopefully lead with audience questions, but I do have a few prepared if you don't have any. Um, if at any point it's hard to hear, please just let us know. Um, but in the interest of time, we'll go ahead and begin with our first presenter. So Keith. Good morning, I'm Keith Corson, uh, president of Desert Air out of uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, I'm pleased to be here to be one of the HVAC representatives to talk to uh, this industry. Uh, to say it's been a, a challenge is a really uh, understatement and, and that's what we're really gonna try to talk about in this uh, short beginning to get terminology and language between the growers and uh, the HVAC folk. And, and that's really one of the biggest issues that I see and, and the tie in to sustainability is with improper information, systems are sized incorrectly. If they're sized incorrectly, then they draw more power than is necessary and it's not sustainable. And really what we have found out is that the uh, HVAC folk and the growers actually talk two different languages and I'll have several uh, examples of that as I go through this uh, short presentation. But one of the key issues really has to be what is the appropriate design parameters that the grower needs for maximizing their yield, for eliminating the mold and mildew that would be damaging the products and, and causing a, a waste, and minimizing the overall cost of the operation. As was mentioned in the earlier panel this morning, as uh, costs start to come down, the pressure to run a lean manufacturing operation, as I look at it from my perspective in ma our own uh, internal operations, we need to lower our costs to increase our profitability. And then finally, this industry has a lot of unique separate loads happening, whether it is the lights on, lights off scenario, which is the most obvious of the two, but it's also the types of plants, the strains of plants, the watering rates, and everything else that comes into play that creates a challenge to select the appropriate HVAC system. So as I like to come back to the moisture side of it and, and, and what's going on, the transpiration is the wild card. Uh, a lot of the industry has been talking about lights. They're the easy one. We get to talk about how much kilowatt a light gives off. It's fairly straightforward. You talk to the lighting manufacturer and you get it done. However, on the plant side of it, here's where the variability comes in. And transpiration is really a process that is uh, determined based on the vapor pressure in the leaf. And the temperature within the room is that surface temperature of the leaf as we go forward. The air and humidity conditions dictate what the vapor pressure value is of the space surrounding it. So this differential in these two is that driving force that creates the movement of moisture from the plant out to air. I come from the indoor pool industry. That's where Desert Air was founded and where I've spent most of my life. It is the same analogy of a grow room to an indoor pool. You have a constant water source, that being the surface of the water. You have a constant water source, that's the surface of the leaves of all the plants. And it's the vapor pressure differential that drives the moisture into the air that we have to be concerned with as we go forward. And this is part of this overall transpiration process that is the lifeblood of the growth and healthiness of the plants that you want to produce for your customers. So when I look at it from an HVAC designer's perspective, one of the things that I need to be able to do is maintain the temperature. I need to maintain the humidity level that's in it. And when I talk about it, so often we hear about people complaining that their temperature is swinging their relative humidity is swinging. And when you see plots of these control rooms, they're all over the place. When I talk about the transpiration process, it assumes a constant vapor pressure. You only have a constant vapor pressure if you have a constant temperature and relative humidity. The other side of the demand for the uh, HVAC system is the turnover of the air to get that normalized or homogeneous environment all over the particular grow room. And so those are, are the elements that I come as the most basic 
a uh, areas for the HVAC. And one of the things that I, I really need to stress is I've, I've been using the term relative humidity, but if there's one thing that you take away as you go back into your grow rooms is throw out the term relative humidity. It's relative. Until you know the temperature, it doesn't tell you anything. So we need to talk about terms such as vapor pressure, such as dew point, they're absolute measures of moisture content. They're the critical ones that will drive what's happening within your plant. They are also the critical ones that drive what's gonna go on within the piece of equipment. So as we look at vapor pressure deficit, that's what the growers call it. In the HVAC industry, we call it vapor pressure differential. I'm a numbers guy. It's two numbers that I'm taking a difference of. That's the driving force. When that number is bigger, it's bigger. When it's smaller, it's smaller. It makes it easy. Deficit, you have to actually have some understanding of what you're trying to do. So it's the two parameters of temperature and absolute humidity that are the critical areas that you need to do. And as we look at this saturation point of what's happening at the surface of the uh, leaf, just as it's happening at the surface of a pool water, uh, this is the indicator when you look at the vapor pressure deficit it's the indicator of the transpiration potential so I think that's the term that the growers need to start to look at when they're designing their operating parameters for their space so that they can communicate to the HVAC people what they want when they uh, select a unit so what happens at the low vapor pressure deficit? This happens when the high, uh, dew points are higher at a, a constant uh, temperature. The stomata starts closing because transpiration is impaired. The results, water droplets start forming on the leaves and that can form the condensation that is the site for mold and mildew. The yield gets reduced because the plant literally is shutting itself down. Conversely, at a high vapor pressure deficit, i.e. a low absolute dew point relative of a constant temperature, the plant wants to save itself. It's transpiring too much. It's the desert factor. It's getting rid of too much moisture, so it's shutting itself down in a self-preservation type mode. Once again, the yield is reduced and the plant health is compromised. So there's this happy, we can't be too high, we can't be too low, it's the three Bears, kind of Goldilocks looking for that favorite bed as we, as we like to do it. So the impact, and this is the part that I'm trying to now get some terminology what, the way I view life in a grow room, is that the vapor pressure deficit really doesn't have an impact on the sensible cooling portion of the lighting cooling, getting rid of the heat. The dehumidification systems that are added during this can add some heat to the space and, and that comes into play. But on the dehumidification side, this moisture that is constantly being released within the grow room, the vapor pressure deficit has a huge impact on the unit's performance. The lower the dew point air that you select for your operation, it's harder to condense moisture. And the technical term is we've got to get it to saturation. And when you have these low vapor pressure deficits, it's farther away. And so you need a larger machine. I will tell you, and I think Brandy will tell you also, I'll gladly sell you larger machines. I make more money, I make more profit. You consume more energy, you consume more cost of energy. This isn't how we should be starting out a relationship. We need to have a definition of what is appropriate for what's gonna go on. So I wanted to give you an example. And so on this particular slide, while it's a, a big number graph, I've set some temperatures as the general range that we're seeing growers operate in from uh, 82 degrees on the higher side to 70 degrees on the lower side. I've, I've seen people want to drive that space down to even 65 degrees uh, on that one. The relative humidity uh, was kind of not uh, chosen as a, a range, but my goal, if you look at that uh, fifth line down there, the vapor pressure deficit in the kilopascal is all the same. It's 1.4. And so what I'm telling you is that at these design conditions, 82 and 62 percent relative humidity versus 70 degrees and 44 percent relative humidity, all have the same vapor pressure deficit. So as I view it from a grower's perspective, if I want to drive moisture at a set rate in my plant, all of these would achieve the same result. 
Now you can start arguing on the temperature side of it. A plant may like a temperature better, but I'm talking about the transpiration process, the process of moving the nutrients up to the plant. So they're the same. Now look at that proportional HVAC, and this is HVAC summed up for both sensible and moisture removal. So the air conditioner plus the dehumidifier together. It's a combined load. Tons of refrigeration is a term that we use in our industry. I apologize for that because it's a meaningless number, but anyways, we're using it to show relative size. If I use that 82 and 62% as the baseline, and then I show from example two, I increase by 5%. Example three, the size of the unit goes up by 26%. When I go to that final number at 70 and 44%, I have to increase the size of the HVAC by a whopping 57%. This is huge. It's all to meet the load that you, when you chose 70 and 44%, dictated on the HVAC designer. So it's a crucial number. And so if we look at it, it's this impact on costs. The larger the HVAC equipment, it increases your capital costs, it increases your monthly energy cost. From a sustainability point of view, it is less sustainable because you're consuming more energy per square foot of canopy, per gram, per whatever metric you want to measure your plant yield on. You will consume more energy. And so this is the part that we, as a grower HVAC community need to start setting the best practices that were talked again earlier and saying what is important and understanding the ramifications of decisions on the selection and the sustainability of the thing. So the grower must be controlled to get its yield. So the temperature and humidity, the complicated balance that you have in your facility, the energy uh, decisions that come out into this optimization process of controlling it. This is a, a very complex issue. We haven't gotten into selection types, control, maintaining constant uh, dew points or, or vapor pressures in, in the room. This is just a starting point to get that conversation going. Thank you very much. Thank you, Keith. And while our next speaker kind of gets up to present, it is kind of striking when you think about it, you know, with, you'd think, well, it's just a plant, right? And of course not. But I mean, just all the different factors that go in, you know, even beyond the energy might take the headlines, but just even thinking about how to set up these systems in the right way, coming from a very small scale to a big scale. And, you know, and dealing with, you know, factories or warehouses that aren't perfect and are very, you know, different through different types of the year, whether it be Milwaukee or Denver, when it's hot and cold and the fluctuations. Um, good luck, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. Um, I'm, hi, I'm Brandy Keen uh, with CERNA. Uh, I am a co founder and senior technical advisor there. Um, I've been doing mechanical system design for cultivation facilities for about a dozen years, <laughs> which, uh, yeah, I'm old. Um, so, <laughs> uh, you know, kind of touching on what Keith said uh, around sizing these systems, you'd be amazed at how many times I have cultivators tell me they want, uh, want it 72 degrees and 30% humidity in week eight of flower, and I go, no, you don't. Here's a price for that. Are you sure you want to do that? Um, because, and then they rapidly go, ah, 50% you know, is probably fine. Right, um, so mechanical systems in your cultivation facility are going to be the single most important decision you make, right? They are going to be the most important decision you make because they're gonna cost you more than anything you do in that building, except possibly the building itself. Um, they're gonna cost you more than your lights. They're gonna cost you more than your control system. It's expensive. Uh, it's also the most consistent or most cons uh, significant energy consuming component of your facility. Generally speaking, your mechanical system is going to consume about half the power in your facility. Um, I was even shocked to learn that uh, in our uh, sustainability meetings. That was, that's, a, that's a true number. Um, and that's because you know some of that is for sensible heat removal. That's the, the removal of the heat that's actually produced in the building. And then latent removal, which is the dehumidification component of your mechanical system. Uh, and then the other reason that it's the most important decision you make is because it's, it's the most risk to your crop. You, nothing is going to destroy a crop faster than the wrong decision on your mechanical system. You can pick the wrong light and grow less cannabis, or you can pick the wrong mechanical system and grow no cannabis. Right? That's, that's really what it amounts to. 
Um, so, I wanted to talk about some, some kind of specific ways in your mechanical systems to reduce energy consumption. Um, and one of those ways is, is through economization, right? Which is the utilization of the ambient conditions to help you maintain uh, the right conditions in your cultivation uh, facility. So really that's the equivalent of kind of opening a window, right? So, and, and most energy codes actually require economization of some kind once you get over a certain tonnage of, of, of cooling system. Um, typical economization, is air side economization, where you are actually bringing in outside air. If it's 45 degrees outside and I need to cool my facility, why in the world am I using a compressor, right? Well, some inherent problems with that. Oh, we have some overlap on this. Um, air side economization and cultivation facilities. First one is odor control, right? If we are bringing air in, we are also exhausting air out. Uh, so it complicates odor control if we're doing air side economization. The other is biosecurity, um, which is really important that we're not introducing pests and pathogens and molds and all of these other things to our crop uh, that are inherent uh, in, the, in the air outside. Um, CO2 con conservation is the big one. Um, that actually works against the intent of the code if we're doing air side economization. The energy code is there so we can reduce CO2 emissions, right? And if we are injecting CO2 into a grow room and then pumping it out, well, we're doing the opposite of what the code is asking us to do by using economization. Um, and then there's cost associated with preconditioning the air. If we have a really humid day or an extremely humid environment, if I'm in an office, I don't really care that much if I bring a little bit of humid air into my, into my room. Uh, if I'm in a cultivation facility, I care very much. And so now I've, I'm, I'm trying to maintain a 50% humidity level and I'm bringing in 90% outside air. Well, that's a problem for me. Um, so how do, I, how do I use economization? In, in my cultivation facilities? How do I utilize that free cooling component? Um, and, and the answer, you can do it through chilled water systems without compromising the environment. Um, chilled water systems are extremely common in process cooling and in, in hotels, in hospitals, in airports, in data centers. Um, 90% of the systems we designed are chilled water systems uh, because, uh, because of, of their intent, because of what they're made for. Basically what they do is they rely on circulation of cold water through air handling units or fan coils instead of refrigerant. Um, it's in a closed loop, it's not adding humidity to your space, this is not an evaporative cooling method, so, so don't mix it up with that. Um, so what that allows us to do is when it is below 40 degrees outside or so, that allows me to use what's essentially a giant heat exchanger, a big old radiator outside, where I can chill my water in my chilled water system utilizing ambient outdoor conditions instead of using compressors. Compressors are the number one consumer of energy in a mechanical system. That's where the vast majority of the energy er, consumption comes from. So if I live in an environment like Denver or, or you know, any cold environment, um, I can eliminate compressors from my cooling system in the wintertime entirely without compromising my environment, without exchanging air. Um, it's a big deal. No special maintenance. It's very easy. It's the simplest system and it, it's incredibly simple. Um, so I don't have to do anything special to do this. I just have to invest in that additional component uh, when I build my system. Um, the really nice thing about that is that it's not just cooling your facility. It's also helping to dehumidify your facility because like Keith said, once you are able to reduce the air to below your dew point temperature, then your cooling system is dehumidifying your facility as a byproduct of cooling because you are reducing your, your air temperature to the dew point. Um, so I'm able to condense liquid on my cooling system coils. So now I'm getting sensible cooling and latent cooling for a fraction of the cost of what it would cost me if I was using compressors. Some other benefits of, of utilizing a chilled water system in an environment like this. Um, 
kind of back to what Keith was talking about related to vapor pressure deficits and, and dew point temperatures, I can actually manipulate my water temperature in the system. It's very difficult or very expensive to look at manipulation of refrigerant temperatures in a system because it's based on refrigerant pressure. But with a chilled water system, I can change my set point of my thermostat for my chilled water. I can drop it to very low temperatures in the right chilled water system uh, to increase the amount of latent cooling I get, slow my fan speeds down so at night I can utilize the system for dehumidification. A lot of, of engineering modifications that can be made to the systems without having to make modifications to the equipment itself in order to improve its output. Uh, if I'm running on a flip, I can share compressors between rooms without sharing air between rooms, which dramatically reduces the electrical infrastructure of the, of the facility, also dramatically reduces the cost of the electrician to operate it. And then for dehumidification, you've got kind of two options for dehu. You can do standard or standalone dehumidification for lights off, or you can force your cooling system to run to dehumidify the space during lights off. And to do that, you've got to do a reheat where you have to essentially offset all the sensible cooling that you get out of the air conditioning system and make it latent cooling only. So to do that, I've either got to create an artificial heat source um, or I have to obtain that heat from somewhere else. So with a chilled water system, I can obtain heat from the lights off room and inject it into the lights on room for reheat and make that temperature neutral, but I'm still not sharing air between those rooms. I'm doing it through the chilled water system. Um, generally speaking, these larger compressors on your chillers or your HVAC systems are going to be more energy efficient than a series of small compressors that, that most folks use for standalone dehumidification. I know Keith's company makes some really nice large dehumidifiers that are probably substantially more energy efficient than those smaller standalone units. But in general, you're, you know, for most solutions, um, you're looking at better energy efficiency by using that cooling system than by using standalone dehumidification. So that's essentially a free reheat. The only thing I'm paying for is what it costs me to run that pump to move that heat from, from room A to room B. Um, water. You guys, reclaim condensate. <laughs> I know Lucas is probably going to talk uh, about this some, um, but it's distilled water. It is the cleanest water you can get. Uh, there's absolutely no reason not to take the water that condenses on those coils, do some treatment, and completely reuse it for, uh, for your watering system. Um, you need to oxygenate it, pH it, sterilize it, do some probably some carbon filtration uh, just in case. Um, but there's absolutely, you're, 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 your plant's not consuming that water, it's borrowing it. You're giving it to the plant, it gives it right back. Just make it a big circle, reduce your water consumption really dramatically. So um, you have to check local codes. Some, some cities don't allow it. But uh, most of them would call it a gray area. They don't, they, don't, they don't really have a specific rule about it. So they don't know to check if that's what you're doing or not. So <laughs> anyway, that's all I got. Thanks, guys. Awesome. And while Lucas is kind of making his way to the stage, um, thank you both for kind of pro providing that kind of that baseline information about some of the HVAC systems. I know as somebody coming from the water side of things, not something we have to think about too much, but you know, cooling towers and cooling, especially as we think about climate change and how we're gonna have to adapt to this new environment we're dealing with is a big question mark and concern for us. Um, and it's something that, you know, when you're creating your own little micro environment in these grow ops, um, you'll be distinctly able to adapt to. Um, and I learned a lot, so thank you very much. All right, great. Um, so my name is Lucas Targos. I work for a company based out of Lafayette, Colorado, uh, called Urban Grow. Um, we are uh, technology integrators uh, on the cultivation side. Uh, my background is in uh, sustainable agriculture. I was an organic farmer for about five years until I moved back to Colorado, to Denver here, um, and actually was picked up by uh, Legal, a sponsor of the event, um, and I ran their cannabis cultivation facility for a couple of years, um, and then was picked up by Urban Grow. Um, so I'm a head of fertigation up at Urban Grow. Uh, we design large um, 
large scale and small scale irrigation systems for the cannabis cultivator. Um, so I'm gonna kind of talk about that. We're switching gears a bit. It's very interesting with the HVAC stuff. That stuff is very over my head. Um, so it's, it's very interesting to hear about it. So um, I'll, I'll speak a little bit more about um, fertigation, condensate as, as Brandy talked about. and. Uh, kind of the process as we go through it. Um, so the big thing in the industry, guys, is um, fertigation, and that's where we're actually directly injecting fertilizer into our uh, nutrient system. Um, it, it's been in, in horticulture for, for many years, and there's many different ways of actually injecting these nutrients into your irrigation lines. Um, uh, primarily, we use um, an automated injector called Argus, which is also a control system. But there's other options out there like Dositron, Hortamax, um, plenty of other companies out there uh, that, that uh, accomplish the same thing through different ways. Um, and I'll, and I'll speak a little bit more about that as we, as we go through my presentation here. Uh, but really the big thing here, guys, is I did want to pull up this, um, this diagram from Netafim. Netafim is the largest irrigation distributor in the world. Um, it could be argued uh, that they are the ones that invented micro drip irrigation, um, precision micro drip irrigation. And this uh, diagram kind of just shows out exactly how the process works that we're pulling from a water source. We're going to be going through filtration, doing nutrient injection, and then out to our crop um, in precision drip irrigation. Um, so from 30,000 feet, that's how the system operates. Um, but in essence, what we're really trying to do here, guys, is first off is uh, reduce our inputs. Those inputs, primarily when I talk about inputs, they're going to be nutrients. Um, and, and coming from large scale horticulture, I will say that's somewhat my motto at, at Urban Grow is to um, bridge the gap between large scale horticulture and the cannabis industry. The technology that's, that, that we've used to grow food on a global scale and that has allowed us, um, unfortunately at some times, to sell burgers and, 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 and fries at McDonald's for so cheap is because of the way we've developed our food systems with the technology we have. That technology is available and so we need to utilize that um, in the cannabis industry. Yes, it'll make us more efficient, but it'll absolutely make us more sustainable as well too. Um, so kind of reverting back, uh, we're, we're trying to reduce our inputs, and in that case, it's, it's nutrients. And just while we're on that point, uh, that is a big industry, it, you, that's a big topic of concern that I have for the sustainability of the cannabis industry. Um, you know, in large-scale horticulture, they, they typically use a two-part or a three-part nutrient system. Um, nutrient regimen, I should say, um, that's derived of different elements, micronutrients um, that's fed to the plant. The cannabis industry, largely in, in, in fact that it's been bred from the so-called basement, um, we, have, we have taken these nutrients and we have spread them out directly into 12-part systems, 14, 16-part systems, um, which is not very sustainable. Uh, we are shipping nutrients that are diluted with water all the way across the world um, to put on our plants and, and it's something that we don't need to do. Um, so that is definitely an area where not only do we want to rethink about the nutrients we're using, but we also want to be efficient with applying those nutrients to our plants. Um, so that's the first thing with fertigation is reducing those inputs and being efficient with the nutrients that we use, even if they are a 12 part or a 14 part or a 16 part. Um, nutrient regimen, we need to be efficient with how we apply those nutrients to the plants so that we don't have waste. And the next thing is going to be is power consumption. Um, you know, typically when we're talking about irrigating plants with flood or with uh, sprinklers, uh, impact sprinklers, we need a lot of uh, pressure to accomplish that and flow. That requires a big pump, and that pump takes a lot of power. Um, so if we can reduce that need of pressure um, and that amount of flow going out to our plants, it's not only going to reduce our power consumption, but again, it's going to kind of parlay into my next point, which is reducing our water, um, our water consumption. We need to be more precise with our water and directly apply it to the crop that we're um, irrigating um, so that it's only used by that individual plant in that micro environment that it's in. Um, the last two things are going to be obviously to reduce labor, which is always a good thing, um, and then finally increase yield. I mean, there has been um, handfuls and handfuls of academic articles out there that have shown um, the benefits of increased yield from micro and drip irrigation. Um, for just about any crop out there. Um, so the same could be said for, for cannabis as well too. And we see that uh, with the facilities that we work with. 
So um, I just want to take this time. This is some of you know, our designs. This is what we like to call a PNID, which is a process and instrumentation diagram. Um, kind of shows the 30,000 feet of what's going on with the system and uh, what we're trying to accomplish. Um, really the big thing here, guys, is that we need to take into account all the water inputs that we have and where we're, where we're getting that water from um, and then how we're going to use that for the crop. So, uh, the first one, which is obviously the most um, apparent, is going to be our municipal water source. Uh, typically, that's coming from the city. Uh, it may be coming from a well or whatever it may be, uh, but our, that's going to be our first water source that typically is going to go through reverse osmosis if need be. Colorado, we do have pretty clean water out here, but a lot of grows operate in Arizona, Nevada, California, where that water um, isn't so clean, so we do require reverse osmosis. That's going to dump into our freshwater tank. The other, as Brandy talked about, is our condensate capture. It's huge, guys. I, I can't stress that enough. Uh, the amount of condensate that's being uh, produced by these facilities, even a smaller scale 20,000 square foot facility um, could potentially be all of the water use that you use when using micro drip irrigation. Um, so capturing that um, and then what we do is we actually send those through condensate filters, very simple filtration system. It's going to impart of UV sediment filtration, pH adjustment, and then um, um, I think that's about it. I think I went through them all. Yeah, the three. Um, and so then we're going to drop back in. We're going to go into our freshwater tank. And the final thing, guys, is actually capturing that leachate. So in horticulture, you're always brought up to, to leach uh, nutrient solution from your plants. Uh, that replaces old ions with new ions. And it's, and it's very good, especially in a, in a soilless media like, um, like cocoa. Um, and so having that leachate leach through your plants and recapturing that and reusing that is very, very important. So what we do in that process is that we're actually going to divert that to drains, capture that leachate, and process it uh, through, through uh, better said, a, a glorified reverse osmosis system um, that's actually going to rip those nutrients out. We're going to have a concentrated nutrient stream uh, that will need to go di to a discharge tank, as I've shown here, um, and then we will actually be able to reuse that water. And so what we do at Urban Grow, what we design is that priority. There's a lot of logic that needs to be um, programmed into this and um, to do that we set priorities and so the first priority is going to be using that condensate and so we do that through ultrasonic tank level centers by monitoring the height of the tank and how much um, flow is actually coming into that tank well if that tank's not full then we go to our wastewater tank um, we process that wastewater well if that wastewater is not available then finally we'll go to that municipal source um, and utilize that so um, a lot of logic, a lot of programming that goes into it, and that's kind of where we step in as experts, is um, you know helping, helping, um, you know guide that the client through that path uh, to allow for this sort of water processing throughout a facility. Um, this is a, a another system which is more of a batch tank system, guys. Um, this is uh, again comes from large scale horticulture where we're using batch tanks to feed out to our system. These batch tanks, in, in essence, what they're using here is uh, we're going to be sending solution out to the plants, and a large times uh, this is used in flood table irrigation where we're actually flooding the entire table. Um, we're going to recapture that through a drain, um, and that's going to be sent back, and it's going to go through a very very sophisticated UV processing um, filtration, uh, and that's actually going to be done back into the tank and then what we do is we actually take readings of EC pH and temperature from those tanks and then we'll actually readjust to what that desired set point is for those nutrients um, on those batch tanks and then that gets resent out in large-scale horticulture I used to know a grower uh, while I was in college that would actually keep a batch tank for nearly nine months um, that is that is amazing water savings at that point guys as long as you can keep pathogens and, and disease down um, and you're able to to reuse 5,000 10,000 gallons of water um, that's extremely sustainable um, and again that came, comes from large-scale horticulture but again that also comes because of their nutrient regimen they're using a three-part nutrient regimen that can be that's going to be much more difficult to do um, when using a so to speak 10-part uh, 12-part 14-part nutrient uh, regimen this kind of just shows the facility layout of the batch tanks. Um, this is a large facility we have up in Canada. Um, you can see it's big. It takes up a lot of space. So that does have to be dedicated. It is something that I just want to bring up because a lot of times I've, I'm brought in late to the game uh, when the facility has been designed and I have to come back and say, well, actually for this size facility, I need 10,000 square feet of head house just to accomplish what you guys are, are trying to accomplish here. So that's another big thing. I know, you know, increasing production space is huge in the cannabis industry. We need to take into account that we need to 
um, allow for larger head house sizes so that we can allow for this water processing. Um, it's a big, big part of your facility. And then I just want to go through a few other things here, you guys. I just have some pictures to show. Um, this is a thermal evaporator. So as I talked about, there's going to be concentrate streams that come off both your RO, your reverse osmosis for your municipal water, and then also for your reclaimed water from your leachate. Um, in places like Massachusetts, they actually have zero waste regulations. So they can literally not put any nutrient water down the drain. And, and to be completely honest, I think everyone should gear up for that. Um, our municipal filtration systems have not been designed to take a ton of effluent nutrient solution from the cannabis industry and process that. It, it, it'll ruin our water processing uh, throughout our cities. And, and, and I, can, I can assure you that we're gonna see this more and more. I think California is probably gonna be the next state that comes online, but a lot of municipalities in, in Massachusetts, it's zero waste that can go down the drain. So in that case, we need to cut down that discharge tank because if you're gonna truck that off for a dollar a gallon, um, we need to reduce that discharge as much as we can. So what we'll do is throw that through a thermal de dehydrator, or thermal evaporator, excuse me, turn that into a sludge and then cut down that waste even more and then that sludge will be trucked off. Um, so just another process that we can use. Here's a picture of one of our UV uh, disinfectant units. Um, Tons of different options here, guys. This is where we really help out in terms of, um, you know, what we can do um, in d disinfecting that the, the, those batch tank systems and reusing that water. Um, like I said, that reclaim process is a reclaim process. We are stripping the nutrients and we're creating fresh water. In a UV process, we are actually just we are disinfecting that water and reusing it, um, seeing what nutrients are left in there and then readjusting um, based on an average to those set points of where we, where we wanted to be. Um, so UV is big, UV, this is, this is a unit that, um, that we have branded for us out of Australia um, and it comes directly from large scale horticulture. You'll see a lot of UV units like this in commercial horticulture facilities. Last one is gonna be our leachate. Um, Reclamation, again, guys, this is uh, essentially a glorified RO system, but this is where we are actually turning that leachate back into fresh water um, and then having that concentrated waste stream. So all in all, what I'm getting at, guys, is that um, there's many different ways to process water and be efficient with what we're doing. Um, irrigation is a, is a cornerstone to what we're doing, um, both in, in, in agriculture, horticulture, and in the cannabis industry, and so it needs to be taken seriously. And that's why um, I do bring up the, the, you know, the idea of your head house space. It's, it's one thing that I come up with a lot of my clients that they are they're not aware of of dedicating that much space to allow for water processing throughout their facility um, and and um, you know furthering their sustainability of their facility so um, so I think that's about it um, love to hear some some questions so thanks guys Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Lucas. And, um, you know, I think just reflecting quickly, uh, you know, we're hearing a lot from this panel about some of the built in environments and some of the grow operations like the ones in Denver that are all indoors. Um, I think I'd be remiss not to mention some of the outdoor water use concerns um, or opportunities, really. Uh, a lot of grow operations, whether it be in Pueblo or Northern California, can use these same principles of, you know, using drip irrigation and making sure that they're using the exact amount of water that they need for these plants. Um, coming from a utility, quasi-regulatory background, you know, when we see people go in and create their operations to be efficient from the get-go, it makes the impulse to go in and regulate or to go in and, you know, to kind of ask a lot more questions. It kind of takes a little bit of that away. Um, and I get calls, probably about three dozen utilities from around the country asking about, how much water use are you guys seeing with this? And for us, it's, you know, half a gallon to a gallon per plant per day, but it's all very controlled. And the ones that were using more than that, they went out of business because their operations just weren't adequate. Perfect. We have about five minutes left. If there aren't any other questions, um, just to kind of wrap up, I was wondering if each of you guys can maybe make one kind of final comment on, you know, with the goal of sustainability in mind, you know, even if you've already discussed it, what really is something that absolutely everybody should be doing with their HVAC and irrigation systems if they really want to be sustainable and to meet some of those benchmarks? Well, we hit a couple of the key points of getting a common terminology and, and getting a specification that, that ends the result. There's one part that we really didn't talk, and that is the hiring of a professional that maintains the piece of equipment. I don't care if you choose the right piece of equipment. If it's never looked at again, 
it will not be sustainable. It's a big issue within our industry uh, for, and every other location that we, we do. And if you want it to run efficiently, have a professional that you trust that is commercial grade, not residential, that can maintain the equipment to the optimum performance. So, I mean, my, mine's, mine's gonna be easy. Is, is, is really just micro and trip irrigation, guys. Um, and to kind of go deeper into that is it's, I wanna say this as lightly as possible is that our industry has a lot of smoke and mirrors. Um, um, and the technology that, that I design with and that I bring to the table and that a lot of companies do um, have been around for 30, 40, 50 years. Um, so, so when you see a company out there that has, has, has this new product with this new way of irrigating this plant, um, you, you gotta think, you gotta step back and think, why didn't, why didn't large scale horticulture think about this? What, how, how, how was this brought up just from the cannabis industry? Um, so use products that are reliable, tried and true, um, that have been around for years. Um, yes, there's been some evolution and, and re-engineering of those products, but under no means um, do you need to jump through hoops because you see something on Instagram um, that a ton of the big boys are doing, right? A lot of times those big boys are doing that because they're getting paid to do that and put it on Instagram. Um, and, and I bring that up because we're in an interesting industry. Um, you know, six out of 10 of my clients bring something to me and send me an email and say, hey, I saw this on Instagram, put this in my facility. Um, and, and we need to stay away from that. That's, I think that's one of the biggest things I bring to the table is that um, we need to step back and kind of look at those smoke and mirrors from a different perspective and realize that we've been cultivating um, food on a commercial scale, on a global scale for, for a very long time. Um, and that the products and the technology that we have is already available. Um, so let's use them, um, let's use them efficiently. And, and um, I'm not here to you know, speak down about any other companies or anything like that, but rather to you know, just do your due diligence and um, use the products that are, are meant for um, cultivating on a commercial scale. Awesome. Well, thank you everybody for all your uh, awesome questions um, and hope you enjoy Denver and the rest of the forum.